tremendous to see so many of you here, as you know that we expected the man and the dog, um, and that the dog might be more interesting, which is why we had a room inside the postage stamp. So it is um, very good to see so many of you here to talk about what is, of course, um, a major piece of constitutional legislation. And I imagine that a number of you were as shocked as we were that the government was going to push this bill, which had not seen the light of day um, before October, um, through the Commons in three days, and there was much um, shock and horror that that was going to be the case. And yet, of course, now it's come back, um, well, it's really brought back on the 19th of December. It's again had three days in the Commons. It's currently in the Lords. We finished the Lords um, very shortly and then back to the Commons. And then, with virtually no scrutiny at all, certainly from the Select Committee's numbers, um, it will be binding in the UK. I mean, I think it's quite remarkable that Nexit has had. Um, more scrutiny than uh, the WAV. I think the parallels between Mexit and Brexit are quite striking that there will be a transition period and ultimately there will be some sort of Canada minus type arrangement <laughs> uh, at the end of the day. But even joking apart, I mean, it really is a significant piece. And of course, for those who think that the um, we are ridding ourselves of EU law, will be sorely disappointed. Direct effect and supremacy is still well embedded in there, in an obscure way, of course, in the beautifully obscure language of the European Communities Act, but of course now not as a member state, but um, through the vehicle um, of the withdrawal agreement. And I do think it is really quite striking that this bill has had to look several ways in its short history, because when it was drafted, it, of course, was drafted to try and keep the leavers happy, which is why the language of direct effect and supremacy is so artfully disguised. But when it was actually appeared for the first time, it was drafted, well, it was published with a view to try and keep the Remainer or the Labour Remainers who might well have voted in favour of the bill on board. And so you have those terrible, had those terrible provisions on workers' rights which did not say what the press said they said. I mean, essentially, the workers' rights provisions essentially said, um, if we are going to depart from EU law, we might write a report to report the fact that we're going to depart from EU law. They didn't really give any substantive protection, despite the fact that they suggested they did. And then, of course, with uh, the new iteration of the bill, it was um, drafted with a view to the fact that the um, uh, Boris Johnson has a whopping majority in Parliament and so can get um, anything he likes through. Now on that note, um, we, the way we propose to present this afternoon is Stevie Martin is going to give an overview of the bill for those of you who um, are less familiar with its content. And then Alison is going to make some more substantive comments and she's done the short straw because I asked her to talk about the evolution um, which is perhaps a dog that hasn't properly barked yet, but will be barking very loudly. And then David Howard, who claims to know nothing about the content of the bill, is, is going to talk quite a lot about <laughs> parliamentary process. Um, and then um, I will mop up with anything else that um, I don't think hasn't been covered and is interesting, but that might not be very much. And then we'll throw the floor open for, I say questions, sort of questions, discussions, observations, I'd like to make it a sort of seminar like as you can in a room as cabinet as, as this one, which is why if anyone does who's in the back room would like to come forward, you really would be welcome. Um, but um, can I thank first of all um, our speakers um, for giving up their time and also thank you very much. Stevie, the floor is yours. So, as uh, has been said, my responsibility is to give you something of an overview of this withdrawal agreement bill. Um, it, in effect, is the mechanism through which the government is bringing into domestic law the agreement that it has reached with the European Union, but also it's the first steps necessary in order to ratify what will now be the treaty between the UK and the EU. Um, it, as a result, then gives effect to this massive agreement document. Uh, which runs to over 500 pages and is 
quite extensive. Um, and it does so in several discrete ways, which I propose to go through very, at a very high level because obviously the content and the substance of those key aspects that are probably the most interesting and significant will be discussed by the other members of the panel. Um, the, the first part of the bill, I suggest, really deals with EU law and what we do with that during the transition period. Um, as has been said, we have this Withdrawal uh, Act 2018, which put in place what would happen when we revert to no, no deal Brexit. Um, and in reality, that would have seen a bit of a transition period as well and, and a process through which we could sit through, but it also had profound consequences for what would become of retained EU law. So under the Withdrawal Act, uh, what we call as retained EU law would become domestic law. And so primacy and direct effect and the other uh, supremacy and so on would cease to have any consequence, arguably. So we now have, under the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, um, an entirely different process, at least for the implementation period. So <laughs> it adds to the confusion, Withdrawal Act refers to transition period, Withdrawal Agreement Bill refers to implementation period. They effectively both mean the same thing. It's the period after exit day, which is now set at the 31st of January. Um, and it's during that period that under the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, we see, in effect, a holding pattern. So EU law continues to have direct effect, regulations, directives, treaties that would have direct effect and so on, they continue to have direct effect. The uh, CJEU continues to have jurisdiction. Um, and we therefore then see a period, at least until the 31st of December 2020, which is when the implementation period ends, of EU law continuing to take take precedence, sorry, um, insofar as there's a conflict between EU law and domestic law. We also see, because the withdrawal agreement itself um, now is the mechanism through which the UK, after exit day on the 31st of January, will interact with the EU, this is the document through which we have the rights um, and so on that are recognised in the withdrawal agreement itself. And so, again, we see an analogy to Section 2 of the European Communities Act in Clause 4, and that acts as a kind of by bringing into uh, domestic law the rights, responsibilities, obligations, and liabilities that are contained in the withdrawal agreement itself. And that, unsurprisingly, creates a new type of law. So under the Withdrawal Act, we have retained EU law, which is all the EU law that exists on the 30th or 31st of January, and then moves into domestic law. Under the Withdrawal Agreement, uh, we have this relevant separation agreement law. And this refers to laws that are passed using these extensive um, Henry VIII powers and otherwise to give effect to the rights, responsibilities, liabilities, and obligations that are uh, codified effectively in the agreement. And some authors have questioned what will happen if there is ever and there shouldn't be a conflict between this relevant separation agreement law and retained EU law. Um, and that seems to be dealt with by provisions in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill which make it clear that courts dealing with any sort of conflict have to interpret uh, e retained EU law and relevant um, separation agreement law in accordance with the Withdrawal Agreement. So it would seem that a relevant separation agreement law will take precedence, so they shouldn't conflict. Um, the other thing to bear in mind as well is obviously the Withdrawal Act 2018 repeals the European Communities Act 1972. That continues under the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, but the bill has uh, the effect, as I say, of a holding pattern. So it puts in place mechanisms to ensure that Section 2, 2 of the ECA continues insofar as uh, EU law remains um, directly applicable and continues to have privacy and the Court of Justice continues to have jurisdiction. Another interesting aspect of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill is the fact that, not surprisingly perhaps, domestic courts will, have, will be able to hear uh, complaints regarding any rights, responsibilities, obligations coming about um, through the Withdrawal Agreement itself. And of course that makes sense as we move through the implementation period, but it's something to keep an eye on in terms of jurisdiction. Um, another thing to, so, so we move through, that's really the big part of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which is European Communities Act and the retained EU law. And then we move on to the next section that I say, which concerns citizens' rights. So that's a big chunk from the Withdrawal Agreement itself. And there's uh, quite a few aspects in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill that deal with 
the incorporation of these rights, the incorporation of these, uh, these responsibilities. Also, interestingly, we have the creation of the Independent Monitoring Authority, and it has the responsibility of uh, monitoring the UK application of those, that aspect of the agreement that deals with citizens' rights, freedom of movement, residents, and so on. Um, we also see in the withdrawal agreement bill the creation of this joint committee, um, which is comprised of representatives from the UK and the EU. Uh, its function is more holistic, so the IMA is focused on citizens' rights. The joint committee looks at compliance with the agreement more generally. Um, it, its powers have been criticised in some respects, uh, but it does have the ability to issue decisions, and those decisions are binding, and um, included within the swathe of uh, delegated powers that the Withdrawal Agreement Bill uh, confers are those that allow ministers to give effect to any decisions reached by the Joint Committee. Um, and finally, I would say that the other big aspect of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, obviously, is the Protocol on Northern Ireland. Um, and I'll, I'll very quickly run through that. So, as I said, the big chunk really is the European uh, EU law, um, and we see this creation of a relevant separation agreement law the ongoing effect of the European Communities Act via the withdrawal agreement itself, um, and the continuing jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. And that really then will see us at least until the 31st of December 2020, currently as we are. Um, we also have, interestingly, uh, and it seems to be an increasing trend, the reference in clause 38 of the bill to the sovereignty of Parliament, and that nothing in the Act which includes the ongoing primacy and supremacy in the effect of the EU law, uh, derogates from the sovereignty of Parliament. And uh, some authors have raised the question about what Clause 38 can mean, whether Clause 38 would enable Parliament to legislate in a way that's inconsistent with the agreement. I wouldn't want to speculate on what could possibly happen, but it is interesting and it is uh, consistent with other insertions in other acts. Um, Something else to note uh, in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, whilst uh, the agreement itself, Article 132, uh, provided for the possibility of extending the implementation period for up to two years by a minister in, um, of the Crown and the Joint Committee. The initial Withdrawal Agreement Bill that uh, government put before the House prior to the general election included a clause that effectively gave the House of Commons a veto over any such recommendation by a minister. So it recognised that the minister, a minister of the Crown could have the power to recommend um, a extension to the implementation period and then it gave the House of Commons the ability to veto it. In the current version of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, there is no expressly, it expressly states that ministers of the Crown in the Joint Committee do not have the authority to seek an extension. And so we have this clash now between a provision in the agreement itself and the withdrawal agreement bill. Um, there's also, and I, I, I'm sure that this will be spoken about in much greater detail, a very interesting clause 30, uh, 26 of the withdrawal agreement bill. And it creates a power that enables the government to make regulations, having consulted with senior judiciary members, about what EU law. Um, or the extent to which courts should be bound by EU law and, and, and the circumstances in which they should. Um, and this doesn't obviously apply to courts that wouldn't ordinarily or arguably be bound by EU law, so not the Supreme Court, but it does raise the question of ministers having the ability to implement or, or pass regulations, possibly through the media procedure, um, allowing courts to bypass EU law. And we then have a direct clash between our obligations under the agreement with the EU and the provisions of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which continue to recognise, in effect, the privacy and the effect of EU law. Um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, there has been an ongoing uh, debate about the degree of protection afforded for workers' rights under both the agreement, uh, but more, more, press, more particularly under the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. Um, there has been some criticism of the current iteration of the bill, in particular the lack of any obligation to provide or all for ministers to um, engage with businesses or engage with unions if they were going to put in place legislation that in any way uh, eroded the rights of workers that were afforded under EU law. The reality is, at least for the implementation period, subject to all of the caveats that I've just outlined, workers' rights should continue to be as they are in the EU level. 
the question then becomes what happens if there is no negotiated agreement at the end of the implementation period and thereafter we're in a state where the UK can legislate as it wishes irrespective. So that's, that tends to be the, the, the debate. Obviously there are arguments both ways. One of the big uh, concerns that has come about most recently has been regarding the uh, rights of unaccompanied children. And uh, in Section 17 of the Withdrawal Act 2018, uh, the government was obliged to seek, in, in its, in, as it was um, enacted and as it stood <coughs> prior to the passing of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2020, I should say. Section 17 says that the government has uh, an obligation to negotiate an agreement with the EU concerning the unification of unaccompanied minors. So that's in accordance with the Bill of Third Regulations, the EU legislation. Um, under Clause 37 of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, however, Section 17 is going to be amended so that the obligation is confined to laying before Parliament a statement of policy between the UK and the EU concerning reunification. And so that has been the, the debate surrounding those provisions. Um, just quickly to, to wrap up, um, there's concerns about the degree of parliamentary scrutiny. So Clause 39 enables the European Scrutiny Committee and the Commons and the EU Select Committee and the Lords to flag EU legislation. And, and they say this was introduced in order to reflect the fact that Parliament will no longer have a say at an EU level following exit day, um, and yet we will continue to be bound by EU law. And so this offers um, the opportunity of putting flags on particular pieces of EU legislation that Parliament might so the government might decide at the end of the implementation period that they wish to legislate differently and respectful. Um, the last two points I won't delve into because Ellison's going to talk about them at length. There's extensive um, powers that have been delegated. They have profound implications across the board, not only for um, at, a, at a high level of constitutional law dealing with parliamentary oversight with respect to executive power, but also they have profound implications on the devolution left. And finally, and by no means last, um, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it creates a unique customs situation for Northern Ireland in which Northern Ireland continues to follow the EU single market uh, rules regarding goods. Um, it remains aligned to the EU rules on customs and VAT, but it also still remains part of the UK's VAT <coughs> excuse me, area. And that's fine during the implementation period because those two things should be consistent. Um, but at the end of that, Northern Ireland will continue to exist in this unique customs either. And that will require checkpoints at certain areas, at certain locations around Northern Ireland. Um, one of the biggest things that I think is of note, and this obviously touches on a devolution point, is the fact that under the agreement, Northern Ireland has the possibility of extending uh, this unique customs situation. But the Withdrawal Agreement Bill provides the mechanism for doing so at a simple majority. So a majority in the Northern Ireland Legislative Assembly could decide that they want to continue with this. And that's completely inconsistent with the Belfast and the Friday Agreement, which require um, a particular form of cross-community sharing. And that includes weighted majorities within the Legislative Assembly of the 60%, and also requires a specific percentage for both, both the Nationalist and the Unionist parties. And so we now have a situation in which very significant decisions concerning the customs uh, nature of Northern Ireland can be made by a majority simply rather than in accordance with the Belfast and the Friday Agreement. And that's that's my whistle stop tour of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. I will now turn it to you. I, I got the short score of devolution, but I'm also going to cheat and not just talk about devolution. So I'd like to uh, talk about um, three things. <coughs> so first, I want to explain a little bit about the devolution context, what the consequences of this act might be on devolution, so you can kind of think about it. Um, second, I want to talk a little bit about the delegated powers. So just like the withdrawal act, there's a huge amount of delegated powers I want to think about, is this too much, what kind of controls are there, and so we're in the right direction. Um, my third um, point is basically, I would say to subtitle it, um, Jaws for the Revenge. In, in case you're wondering why, because the tagline of this film is the first time they use the quote, this time it's personal. And <laughs> if you're wondering why I'm using that, it's because 
Um, in the last year, we've been talking a lot about different understandings of the separation of powers, about how far we separate powers between the legislature, the executive, and the courts. We've been talking about a potential shift away from the executive towards the legislature and our understanding of how far the courts get involved in defending the constitution. It's going in the opposite direction, and a lot of these have come in between lap one and lap two. So between the opinion of the Joint Bill 1 that we first got and the current version, which is the one that's going through Parliament. So hence my joke you this time it's personal. And it's not just me who says this, so in case you think I'm, I'm being a bit cruel, um, I would like to give a quote from a not related to David, Lord yeah. Howard of Newport, who to some extent referred to Clause 26 as a petulant response and a gross intrusion of the executive into the proper realm of the judiciary in the House of Lords debate yesterday. So it's not just me, okay? So I can now fall back on someone else saying it's also a bit petulant. Okay. Um, so I'll start a little with um, devolution. So just to give you a little bit of context for those of you who aren't sort of fully up to date with what's going on within devolution generally, um, in the UK we are devolved, and this means that there should be some kind of element of understanding between Westminster, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, until recently, literally days ago, there was no government in Northern Ireland, so this made it rather difficult for us to liaise with Northern Ireland. There now is a power sharing agreement, and it should be moving forward and moving away from government by civil servants. Another aspect of the context of coming up to the um, to European withdrawal agreement is obviously we have tensions for a number of reasons. Scotland and Northern Ireland voted differently from England and Wales. So there's already tensions to the extent to which there's a perceived democratic deficit between what the devolved nations wanted and where Westminster is going. That wasn't necessarily eased through the process of Brexit negotiations because there were all sorts of tensions arriving um, arising from the discussions or lack thereof in joint ministerial committees to try and get a sense of what the different component parts of the UK wanted when it came to Brexit. This all came to a head in the European Union withdrawal agreement, which was enacted without Scotland's consent. So in case you're wondering why this might be an issue, um, the Civil Convention it is a convention that applies when you're looking at issues where Westminster um, legislate in an area of devolved power, and also by practice is being seen to extend to a new modified devolution settlement. The requirement under Sewell is that Westminster will not normally legislate in a devolved area of power without the consent of the devolved nations. The European Union Withdrawal Act was enacted initially without the consent of either Scotland or Wales. And there's all sorts of tensions between Scotland and Wales's versions of their own version of the Continuity Bill, which led to a case in the Supreme Court in Scotland. So you can already see what you've got an issue of tension. And a lot of this was over what happens when the powers that are currently regulated in Europe come back to the UK. If they're in a devolved area, do they go to the devolved nations or do they go to Westminster? And initially, they went to Westminster on a stopgap basis and then they go on most regulations that were made on the devolved nations. And then that got changed and modified and reversed. So they did go to the devolved nations, but the way in which it works is the government can enact delegated legislation to, as the Welsh call it, pull in the freezer. So you take the devolved areas um, and you pass the delegated legislation, so you'll actually you can't legislate in these areas for a couple of years until we've sorted out the common framework. And we won't do this without your consent, but consent doesn't mean consent. Um, consent means we've asked you, and even if you say no, that's still consent. So you've got this kind of, you can imagine there's already tensions going on between the nations. So against that backdrop, we have to go away and say, well, what, if anything, is the European Union Withdrawal Agreement still doing in this particular backdrop? Well, the first thing I want to draw to your attention is civil. So we have the civil convention, and this is an odd application because this isn't to do with legislating in a devolved area, it's to do with legislating in a way that will modify the devolution Sections. So if you look at the statutory expressions of the civil convention, it talks about not normally legislating without consent if you're legislating in a devolved area of power. So this is the practice rather than the state of civil convention because you're modifying the devolved settlement. 
Nevertheless, the UK government decided it would be a good idea to trigger a risk of consent motion and ask Scotland and Wales for their consent to the European Union for a leader. Guess what they said? Go on, have a guess. Right. You'd be glad to know that the Scottish Government decided to recommend to the Scottish Parliament to say no. Uh, the Scottish Parliament has said no. Uh, the Welsh Government has recommended to the Welsh Assembly to say no. Um, the uh, Welsh Assembly are currently thinking about it. Uh, they have, so they haven't um, passed uh, a state upon this yet. The Constitutional and Legislative Affairs Committee of the Welsh Assembly will be reporting on this on Monday. So you can wait to see what they say, and then you can decide whether they're also going to say no or yes. Now, as you know, it's a convention, and as Miller one lovingly tells us, uh, courts are not the parents or guardians of conventions, they're mere observers. And as we know from the European Withdrawal Agreement Act itself, if you enact a piece of legislation without consent, it's still valid, it's still legitimate. But it doesn't help, is probably the best way of putting it. Why I draw this to your attention, because as we move forward and as we look through the Withdrawal Agreement Bill itself, you're creating all sorts of powers for Westminster to act and also for the whole bodies to act, but also for them to act together to deal with how we have to then act to make modifications to make sure that as we transition and as we move on to our new relationship with Europe, all the laws that we put out there work. And we've also got to think through how we make common frameworks. So a lot of measures to do with market agreements fall in the default powers, so things like agriculture, food, fisheries are default. So you need to think about how we're going to work together to get these common frameworks. So in essence, with all these default powers, we need to think through how do we set up a mechanism where the different governments and legislatures can work together to come up with frameworks that they can agree with and which work. Now, Wales has already started the process of this. It's been negotiating with Westminster government and it's been looking at how Section 12, which is the provision that empowers you to make delegated legislation to say Westminster access, which is not the default bodies, they've been talking about where these may be needed, what powers they might be useful, and they've come up with an agreement that worked. That's not yet happened in Scotland. We're going to see a different backdrop between Wales and Scotland. So the more we create firm tensions, the more we start to threaten the union. And there's not a lot in the withdrawal of the bill is offering a lot of comfort as to how to deal with it. Yes, they've got the powers, yes, they can work together, but there's nothing in there about how are we going to set up these structures, what should the guideline principles be, how are we going to govern together to make this work. So it's almost like sort of it's there, it's, they've got the powers that they need, but it's problematic because it's just rationing up these tensions against the backdrop of yet another series of requests from Scotland for an independence mechanism. And Scotland has also recently enacted legislation about how Scotland will hold referendums if it decides to hold a referendum. So it's gone through, it's gone to the full, full on extent. So against all this backdrop, there isn't really anything there to deal with this. And then we come to Northern Ireland, which Stevie raised. So the difficulty you've got with Northern Ireland is this uh, um, element of how it's rushing up tensions even more because of how they can extend the Northern Ireland Protocol. So within the Northern Ireland Protocol, we're going to have to come up with all sorts of rules and um, regulations about how you recognise relevant groups. You've got this wonderful system of you're in but not in at the same time. So you've got goods that will come from the UK that come to your right. And some of those will be internal movements, and some of those might then go to other bits of Europe, which means they then become potential external because you're trying to deal with not wanting a strict border between your and the island. So how do you do this? You're going to have a series of potential ways of working out which goods you should and shouldn't be taking because you think they might come to Europe. So you need a whole series of regulations and agreements to come up and work with this. So you need structures to get these in place and to make sure these are taken in the right way. Put that against the backdrop of if you need to extend this, so you've not got your sorted, you want to extend this agreement because you think it's working or not working, you do it by simple majority. Not through the process of making sure you've got cross 
community support. Now, why might that be an issue? Well, the reason why that, that might be an issue is obviously within Northern Ireland, you want to make sure you have cross community support for court decisions. It's important. But you want to make sure you're not rushing, and rushing up pensions within Northern Ireland. But more specifically, you need to put it against the backdrop of how we now have power sharing within Northern Ireland. So, uh, Northern Ireland has come up with a new power sharing agreement. You can read it online. It's called New Decade New Approach. And one of the aspects of this agreement is there are various concerns that they're using the petition of concern process too frequently. So the petition of concern process is a way of saying, I'm concerned about this piece of legislation, so you don't have to have cross-community support, okay? rather than it just being taken by a simple majority. And the idea is, because it was felt this was being refused, the agreements say that these now petitions of concern will only be used for exceptional circumstances as a last resort. The idea being that hopefully we'll be able to get more measures through. Put that against the backdrop that says if you want to extend this, you just need a simple majority. What might you be tempted to do? To raise a petition of concern, which might then be perceived not necessarily being an exceptional circumstance, or a measure of last resort, which might start rushing up pensions even more. Against the backdrop, it's taken pretty much the last two years to get the situation where we have a system of government in Northern Ireland. So it's not just the concerns about our new Northern settlement, but not on possible consequences to power sharing in Northern Ireland, which is a delicate stage. We have the agreement, but there are still disputes and discussions about how much money is coming from Westminster through Northern Ireland to move this forward. So it's not you're in a delicate position and you're rushing up potential pensions. And that's the issues really with regards to devolution. It's you've got these powers, there's a system, but there isn't necessarily enough in place to make it work properly. And if that isn't put in place, you can rush it up pensions that are already threatening to split the union. So it's almost like what isn't really there to be causing the issue. With regards to delegated powers, um, those of you who are used to reading the European Union Withdrawal Act and other pieces of legislation will be used to the wonderful little phrase, um, a minister may do something when he considers it appropriate. And you'd be glad to know that this lovely phrase reappears in the European flag too. So you have huge amounts of broad powers. So the House of Lords delegated powers of the Regulatory Reform Committee counted these up for us. And so you'd be glad to know that in the bill of 42 clauses, the phrase an appropriate authority made by regulations makes such provision as the authority considers appropriate appears nine times in the bill. Uh, the phrase, a minister of the crown made by regulations, dot, 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 appears 15 times in the bill. So these are broadly based powers. The committee was not as concerned by these powers as it was by the European Union Withdrawal Act. And that's because of the nature of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. A lot of the powers that have been given to be delegated are more choices. You can do certain things, and that's a policy decision. So it might be harder to use the phrase when necessary because the withdrawal agreement itself is not necessarily set out specific purposes of when these powers might be needed. So they were less concerned by the breadth of these powers in this bill than they were by the breadth of the powers in the European Union Withdrawal Act. And I can see this, but my concern is most of these are going through negative resolution procedure, not affirmative resolution procedure. <laughs> Moreover, there is no sifting committee. So there is no ability for a committee to say, well, I know it goes to a negative, but I think actually this should go to the affirmative. And so you've got less scrutiny over these broad powers, and that's why it's seen as concerning. It's not just broad powers. Yes, our friend the Henry VIII clause is going to be here. So there are lots of Henry VIII clauses in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. So as we know, Henry VIII clauses allow the ability to modify or amend primary legislation. We'd be glad to know that you do have to have the affirmative resolution procedure generally for any form of exercise of delegated power that would modify primary legislation or modify 
by a principal aspect of the case in the law. So at least I'm going to be affirmative resolution over most of the heavy VIII clauses. So here are some examples for you. Uh, you can use clause 8 to amend the Immigration Act with regard to the regulation of frontier workers. You can use clause 11 4 to amend any Act of Parliament with regard to setting and procure rights for citizens' immigration rights decisions. And you may make any measure that could be made by an Act of Parliament under clause 21 when you're dealing with a non like implementing the non like open island protocol. So you've got lots of broad provisions. My favourite is clause 21. Here we go. This says a minister of the crown may by regulations make such provision as the minister considers appropriate in consequence of this act. Uh, when doing exercising this power, you may modify an enactment. An enactment is defined as not including crime legislation passed or made after the implementation completion date. In other words, includes legislation enacted prior to the implementation date. So if you want to Modify the Magna Carta in order to implement the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, off you go. Because <laughs> anything enacted up to the end of the implementation date is a printed Don't tell me. Scratch that. I didn't say that, actually. <laughs> but um, it's an incredibly broad power in order to bring it in. And just to add to the joys, it can amend the Withdrawal Agreement. Bill, the Withdrawal Agreement Act, can it can be enacted itself, so that that will be enacted prior to the implementation date. And this one is only due through negative resolution procedure, not affirmative resolution procedure. So it's, it's an incredibly broad catch all provision if you suddenly realise you haven't quite implemented the Withdrawal Agreement properly and need to enact delegated legislation in order to do so. That's what it's there for. But it's worrying because of its breadth and because of the lack of. It's been criticised both by the House of Lords Constitution Committee and by the House of Lords Delegated Powers of Executive Reform Committee. So it's um, seen as a worrying um, clause. And much as there can be court scrutiny over these decisions, and court scrutiny over Henry VIII powers, we know from cases like the Public Law Project, and of course we read down all Henry VIII powers, it's difficult to know how far that will go and how far the legal form of protection is there for the courts. And there's a lack of parliamentary scrutiny over the use of these clauses. It may be they never get used, but maybe it's just there as a catch all in case it becomes problematic. But the fact that it's there in some countries is worrying. So I think it's mostly negative, no sifting committee, and this becomes worrying because if you've been a follower of the public law project, which has been looking at delegated legislation that's been enacted under the European Union Withdrawal Act, we realise that this has been used quite frequently to make policy choices, often in negative resolution procedures with very little scrutiny, and there's been lots of use of urgent procedures to that things through quickly. So the difficulty is what will this be used for and how can we make sure there's sufficient scrutiny to make sure that it's just implementing the agreement and not to sneak it beyond that. And that's the concern that people have. Which brings me to my final point this time, it's personal. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Because I'm saying there's this context of a perceived shift of power away from the executive towards the legislature with some aspects of court control and court control. And you can see a perception of this moving back. And so various indications of this moving back. So section 13 of the European Union Withdrawal Act, which brought in the meaningful vote and saw lots of parliamentary controls, is repealed by clause 31. Um, we um, also, um, as we know from clause 33, in the first incorporation of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, a minister may agree to an extension of the uh, implementation period, but they had to make the full parliament subject to resolution. The new clause, clause 33, says you can't. Ministers are not able to agree to extension of the implementation period. So you've moved a power of parliamentary oversight into you don't have the power to do it. Which again um, is accepting to move away from these kinds of clauses. Also, clause 31 in the first incorporation of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill had this aspect of ministers making statements to the Commons in the hope of the end of the implementation period about what the future relationship might be aspects of debates and discussions and possible directions, that is no longer there. The implementation date 
um, you've got your date, you've got it set, you can't extend it, that's the end of it. And that becomes an issue. Also, uh, clause 35, ministers may not agree to the use of the written procedure in the joint list of one council. Why am I raising that? If it's written down, you can read it, you can see, you can scrutinise it. If it's not written down, you can't. So it's removing an opportunity for Parliament to look at what's going on under default legislation, look at what's going on and raise questions and hold ministers to account for these activities. We then have clause 38, which recognises the UK Parliament's sovereign. Thank you. I, I, I was wondering. Uh, I'm glad I now know that the UK Parliament is sovereign. Uh, and it's been recognised, which as we know, when you recognise things, you can't, so you're not legally enforcing them, you just say, oh look, Parliament is sovereign. The question is why is it there? Because the general consensus is you can't really enforce it. It's just saying it's still sovereign, it is, and it definitely is. But why is it there? Is it, there? is it just to send a message, Parliament is sovereign, so be careful about how far we go? I don't know. We we'll have to see where that will go. And that brings us to my final favourite clause, Clause 26, with the amazing ability to um, instruct a course. So the way in which it works in the European Union withdrawal agreement is that um, the Supreme Court wasn't bound by retaining the UK slot and could decide to depart using its normal rules to not follow precedent. Everyone else was. Clause 26 allows ministers to say that those other courts may also now not be bound by decisions of the European Court of Justice as to what the meaning of retaining EU law is. And the um, ministers will set out who these courts are, when they can depart, and what criteria they're supposed to use when they decide to depart from the case law. Um, don't worry, it's got a sunset clause, so you can only do this within the implementation period, but obviously the measures you need to take will exit after. Um, there is consultation, we'll be consulting the President of the Supreme Court, the Lord Chief Justice, the Lord President of the Court of Session. Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland and senior president of the Tribunal and others as the minister considers appropriate. So I'm not really sure what they can do other than say we don't like this and it runs the risk of drawing the courts into making political decisions when they're being consulted, which is its big problem. It is subject to the of the procedure, so at least there's some element of control over what is going on. Um, this will have a knock on consequence in the default body as well, because they may have implemented that um, EU law differently, and then along comes an instruction that you're going to need to make different interpretations without the default body having to kind of say in how it's going, as well as there being not necessarily any clear parliamentary scrutiny. As you can imagine, it could cause all sorts of problems for legal certainty, because you're constantly going to say, can we not follow this court when you rules in any or potentially, if you still have to go to the Supreme Court, which is going to cause great use of lawyers, um, because there'll be lots of court cases. But it can create all sorts of uncertainty and difficulties and tension as we move up. It's been criticised by pretty much everybody. The House of Lords Constitution Committee, the Public Law Project, the Bingham Centre for the Law, Lord Booth and Lord Anderson in the House of Lords yesterday, as well as Lord Howard and Lord Thomas, uh, you name it. It's been highly criticised, but it's there. The House of Lords proposed an amendment, but then we drew. So it's still on the bill, and we've got to wait to see how far it goes. There's still no real explanation of why it's there. So I just wanted to draw to your attention these three features. There is a respect for devolution, but there isn't necessarily enough there, and there's problems with creating extra tensions because of the backdrop of the sort of consent. There's a huge amount going into towns and perhaps less scrutiny than they need, and there are these clauses that seem to be shifting the balance of power back towards the government and away from scrutiny by the legislature and the courts. Thank you. Do you want to wrap up and tell us where you've gone wrong? No. I just want to talk about some parliamentary procedure in the in black suit. Um, if you remember last October, the uh, first plan <laughs> got through its second reading, but then its program motion was defeated. 
which the government then used as its cause of death to uh, campaign for a general election. Um, what the um, lost the program motion meant was something quite odd. Because of the way the standing orders of the public business house comes in written, um, if the government moves a program motion, or if it passes or, or just if it moves a program motion, the normal rules about what happens to the bill is all disappointed. <coughs> so that um, normally, um, well not normally, but if the government doesn't move anything on the procedures for the bill to, be, to follow, um, the bill is automatically sent to the public bill committee. And the public bill committee is a small committee uh, of members of the professional game size, uh, which has hearings. So you can have witnesses say what they think about the bill. It's like a uh, sort of a mini selection team before the committee moves on to look at the bill clause by clause. But that uh, standing order is disappointed if the government moves a program motion, and if it moves a program motion and loses it, the bill falls into a weird form of parliamentary limbo. This last happened with the House of Lords bill, and the coalition bill also fell into that limbo. It can only come out of the limbo if the government itself, because the government in charge of the bill, moves a procedural motion to say what should be done with this bill. So the government could have done that. They could have moved another procedural motion, having negotiated with the other parties as to how the, the bill would be dealt with, how the value would be dealt with. But they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to negotiate, and it was just an excuse to have a campaign for a general election. So we had a general election, and uh, welcome back to the majority of government. The um, <coughs> big difference situation before the, uh, the election and now is that pretty much now the government um, can rely on the majority in the House of Commons to enforce its will on procedural motions. Now, uh, the standing orders of the House of Commons give the government lots of powers anyway, which it holds regardless of whether it has a majority or not. But um, for a series of rather interesting interpretations, um, lots of those powers are undermined in the previous House, or in the previous Parliament. Um, to the extent that, with the help of the Speaker, which is rather helpful Speaker, uh, and uh, an opposition majority, the government's powers to control the House um, could be set aside. So, in effect, um, you could use standing order number 24, uh, which allows for uh, emergency motions, uh, not just to have uh, a general debate about something on a vague motion that the House has considered something, but you could use that to suspend the normal rules about the control of the agenda. And so, if you have a majority, you could get that through, and you could take control of the agenda that you're looking at there away from the government um, and pass it on to the left. And that was going to pass Acts of Parliament, for example, the bank. Um, so, the situation now is that the government's most majority. So that even if the speaker were sympathetic, we don't know this because it's too sympathetic, it's the speaker, and even if the speaker were sympathetic, the, the government would still bring the substantive votes on any uh, attempt to uh, take control of the agenda. So that the government, it's not, it's not the same position as the, 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 as the government before uh, 2017, uh, <coughs> um, it's not in that position because the, the new procedural judgments by the speaker still stand. But having a majority is a good substitute for um, the, the powers that it used to have. So what happened when um, the new parliament met? Um, the first thing was the fact that the speaker suspended the rules in favour of the government. This is the new era we're in. So, um, 19th of January, the, the Parliament um, is meeting for the first time as a substantive uh, new Parliament. The people are sworn in, the speakers have been chosen, and it's the first day of business. Um, normally, to move um, a motion, 
you need to give them notice. And notice is the topic much more there. You need to give them notice the previous day that um, you're going to move a procedural motion, for example. But what happened on the 19th was that the Speaker allowed the government to move a motion without notice that the House would sit the following day, or Friday. House does not normally sit on a Friday, um, except for 13 Fridays a year, on which it considers private ministry. So but the government wanted to get the second reading of that through as quickly as possible, and did that by means of procedural motion, which it moved without notice, and which the Speaker allowed them to move without notice. That wasn't a great start. But that shows that we're in a new era. Right? We're no longer in the era of um, John Burko and uh, an anti government majority. We're now in the era of uh, Lindsay Hoyle and, and a government majority. So, first reading of the bill, uh, which is uh, just a formal announcement of the bill, is, um, is on its way, uh, was done the same day. And the, um, the government has a concession um, to get its five years um, um, made a bit more acceptable. <laughs> uh, publish the bill straight away. Um, and then uh, proceeded to second reading on the, on the two. Um, second reading goes through. But also, unlike the previous occasion, the program motion goes through. The program motion is a motion by which the government. Uh, controls the further discussion of the bill in the House of Commons. The, um, and obviously this time it got through so that there was no complication by parliamentary rulemaking. The bill um, is um, arguably this, I think I've done before, if a, uh, a, a bill of first rate constitutional importance. So uh, the convention with such a bill is that it's her. Uh, uh, in committee of the whole house, not in a small committee. Um, which is fine. It means that every MP gets a chance to intervene, to speak, and to move amendments. But of course, one of the effects of that is that there's no public bill committee stage of hearing evidence. In fact, there is no evidence. Um, it's kind of an interesting aspect of that parliamentary procedure that the more important the bill, the less likely you are to hear evidence about it. Um, in the part of the procedure itself. Um, the amount of time allowed for discussion in committee was very similar to the amount of time allowed in the committee of the total of um, It was two days. Two days um, to complete committee uh, with what are called knives. So a knife um, is um, a an internal deadline within the time allowed uh, for the bill. And when you get to the deadline, the, uh, the government gets a vote on any amendments that um, it's moved, uh, but any amendments that have not been moved by anybody else to support. Um, so it's so, so, uh, a useful device for the government to make sure that it doesn't have to um, uh, win votes on opposition amendments and, and gets its appeal through on its timetable. In fact, if you look at the number of hours um, specifically allowed for the bill, the, uh, the new program motion um, was one hour longer than the previous one, 16 hours rather than 15 hours, um, and it was two proper days. So it is slightly better than the defeated one. Uh, the defeated one um, had 15 hours split between uh, three hours straight away now, followed by 12 hours the following day. Which is kind of ludicrous amount of time the Parliament to sit. So it really was, it was slightly more reasonable. It was, it was basically eight hours on two proper days. Um, and then it allowed one day for the report stage, consideration stage, when the bill comes back from the committee, and the third reading, which is actually pretty standard for all bills. Um, now, what happened was, and this is Again, welcome to the world of the majority government. No amendments were passed in committee in the Commons. It's not a very well known rule, it's, it's a rule that where a bill is committed to the committee of the whole House, 
and it is not amended, there is no report stage. Right? And there was no report stage. This bill had no report stage. So it goes straight to the reading. Third reading, um, you can only talk about what's in the bill and what, what's not in the bill. And it's a, a usual straight up and down vote. But this is where the devolution story um, intervenes, at least in case. Because you are allowed to move a third reading, and if the speaker selects it, it um, um, allows a debate and vote on it. Now, the reasoned amendments, uh, that is, um, uh, motions that say, let's not pass this bill for the reading because, and you put your reasons in for why um, uh, it shouldn't be passed. And the Scottish National Party moved the reasoned amendment a third. The reasoned amendment said that the House declines to give a third reading to the bill because the Scottish Parliament has not consented to those parts of the bill which encroach on devolved competences, and because it fails to take into account the fact that people stop the most overwhelming in name, and further believes the bill is not fit for purpose as it continues to undermine the fundamental principle of the Scotland Act 1998 by reserving to the UK Parliament powers that would otherwise be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Okay. So um, that's one of the interesting things that happened. First is why is that happening at all? That's because there is currently no way in which the Commons can discuss the lack of a legislative consent motion from the Scottish Parliament of the um, right. There's no part of the uh, procedure for Commons that allows the, the House to, to, to react to the lack of a consent motion. So the only way you can do this is by this is by a reasonable amendment of third reading, which the Speaker selects, and you have a vote um, saying, let's not um, uh, uh, pass this bill because of the lack of the vote consent. Now, um, actually, there is another way to show it to me. It's, it's rather um, assertive. Um, so, the point that this, the, the lack of legislative consent is arguably a threat to the union, which well, now this has been talking about. Um, that, that's overcome by the common, simply by voting down the reason the of the reading. So, so if you think this is unconstitutional, well, what's the, what's the constitution among friends? And the friends on the majority in the bill, and the majority in the common, so are voting for the bill. So I should uh, mention one thing. Which is that when the vote came on this reason amendment, the official position abstained. Um, so it was defeated, the, the motion, uh, uh, the SFP motion was defeated by 329 votes to 62. And uh, that's very funny. Uh, the um, opposition spokesperson said um, that they're abstaining because they object to the bill. Um, in other ways. Right? But, although they're sympathetic um, to, to the intention behind the motion, um, they're, they're against the, the bill for other reasons, and so they're not going to vote for the motion, the reason amendment against it, which is very odd. Um, and just raises questions about who now supports the devolution settlement. Okay, 62, so you know, I'm not sure about the rest. Um, the other thing that's puzzling about this procedure um, is just how pacific everyone's been. So the SNP moves a very polite reason amendment that doesn't get reported in the news. The main opposition party doesn't support it. Um, it all goes through that anyone notices very much, apart from the Scottish National Party making polite points. Um, it, this is in rather sharp contrast to the events of the 1880s when the Irish party engaged in the most extraordinary and sometimes brilliant campaign of parliamentary obstruction, which you can still do with the right imagination and the right take on. Um, so the 
I'm, I'm just puzzled. I'm humbled about that why this is not happening. You would expect at this stage, this kind of story, um, people asking themselves the question, what would Parnell do? Or more to the point, what would Joe Bigger do? Joe Bigger needs to be better known. He was the chief whip of the Irish party who invented all the tactics in the North Parliament or halt in the Irish obstruction. And there is, of course, one thing that you could do at any point when you've got the floor, which is to move the previous question, which is to move basically the House moves and enters business, and then to um, misbehave during the votes, which is pretty much what the Joe Big was doing in 1881. Um, so that's not happening. It was very, very polite. Talking about polite, the bill is now in the House of Lords. Now, possibly the most polite legislature uh, that's ever existed. Um, but it does have rules. I don't know how to spend much time there. We have spent more time last week, um, and and look at it. We didn't think that rules at all. We just said, "Well, we need to be able to compromise." That's the big thing. But it does have rules. One of its rules says that um, no bill shall be read twice in the same day. No committee of the whole house shall be seen any bill the same day as the bill to be read the second time. No report shall be received by any committee of the whole house to the the same day such bill goes through the bill, many amendments are made to such bill, and no bill should be read the third time, the same day that it is reported from the committee. So that's standing order number 46 of the House of Lords. So, consequently, if you want to um, um, consider a bill in the Lords as fast as it was considered in the Commons, you'd have to suspend the standing order. And if you suspend the stand, the attempt to suspend the standing order of the House of Lords, people can put in whatever amendments they like to the motion to suspend, and can take days discussing the motion to suspend. So the government um, has not attempted to suspend the standing order. So the House of Lords is considering the bill um, rather more sedately than the Commons. So, but basically, it's um, it, it took the, 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 the um, uh, second reading on one day, um, but it started the committee stage the next day. And it's taken several days of committee, and then when it's finished the committee, it will go to the court. And it will take a couple of days of report. Um, the court. Um, the current timetable, though, then says it goes to third reading on the same day as the committee's report, which is against the rule. So they've got to fix that somehow. Um, but I should say that the, the standard way to do things in the is not to vote at the committee stage. It's only to vote at the court stage. So the fact that a, 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 an amendment has been withdrawn is the normal thing to do in the courts. So there still might be uh, votes on, on, on the amendments that are mentioned at the court stage when that happens. But um, House of Laws being complex is, it doesn't just have rules, it has uh, practices, uh, recommendations. Um, the kind of thing we do now, the kind of culture that's not the political down, at least in Erskine May, and in the companion to the Sand Order. So the House of Lords does have recommended minimum intervals between the stages of the bill. And I just want to um, um, say what those are and you can compare those to this bill. So, um, first recommendation is that there should be two weekends between first reading and debate on second reading. Two weekends. So a um, uh, you know, minimum of 10 days. Really. Um, so the bill uh, was read for the first time on the 9th of January in House of Lords, which is the day that it passed the Commons. There was no hanging around. Now. Second reading was on the 13th. So that, that recommendation plainly lost. Second recommendation is there should be 14 days between second reading and the start of the committee stage to allow people to think about amendments and to put amendments in. So uh, second, was on th second reading of course on the 13th of January, committee stage started on the 14th. 
Right? So that recommendation um, not stuck to either. And, and we said that the uh, recommendation that most of the main solution that they made goes on for all bills of considerable length and complexity. So I think that's probably the answer. Um, uh, 14 days between the end of the release stage and the start of the report. And so for this bill, what's um, intended, according to the parliamentary website, is that the release stage will end on the 16th and the report will start on the 20th. Okay. And then um, uh, there should be, says the recommendation, three sitting days between the end of the report stage and third meeting. The present intention is to hold both of those on the same day, on the 21st. And so you can see that the timetable can plot this with the lesser of the House and Lords meetings, uh, but it doesn't um, uh, comply with any of the recommendations and practices of the rules and is being squashed. Now, the law being the rules, um, um, if people didn't like this, they could do something about it. Now, what, what you do about it, what the is to behave and cause trouble, is you put down the next amount of amendment because the, uh, the laws doesn't normally have procedural motions and the government doesn't have a majority in the law. So the laws could uh, extend the committee stage basically forever if you really wanted to by putting down more and more amendments to more and more government tools to do. But um, it won't. And it won't, um, first of all, because um, people don't seem to have the energy. And secondly, because it was a broad interpretation um, of the uh, Convention, um, so, sort of the Salisbury Addison Convention, which says that um, the government, go government bills which form part of the government's manifesto of election will not be blocked by the House of Lords. And from the speeches yesterday and the day before, uh, it seems that on all sides of the House of Lords, it's accepted that this is a, a manifesto bill. Um, Raise interesting questions about uh, what that means and all the complications we've heard on whether that was even could ever be a manifesto. Uh, but it's accepted on all sides that this is a manifesto bill. And so I expect that what will happen is this bill will be uh, rapidly passed by the rules and probably an amendment. Though if an amendment is passed, um, then it will go back to the Commons and the Commons will then um, either accept, do what the government says, or either accept the amendment. Um, or close to that, and the rules of the bill. So, as I said, welcome back to the world of the majority <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Michael, who you've heard quite a lot of talking, and you might want to talk yourselves. I said I would wrap up um, with some observations which have not been made. In fact, my colleagues have been so comprehensive. Um, I've got very little to say. I've got four brief points I want to um, make. The first one actually builds on David's final point about um, welcome back to the world of majority government. Um, now, of course, this um, Web 1, um, as well as Web 2, um, was drafted. And unlike the 2018 Act, the Euro Act, um, which had extensive con prior publication and consultation with all sorts of interested parties, None of that went on. And there is a rumour, though I don't know if it's true, that in the drafting of these bills there are always sacrificial lambs that are put into the bills um, in order for the government to make some grand concession. Now, of course, in this world of um, the majority government where um, there will be no, like no amendments on the bill, the question is the sacrificial lambs will still be there. Um, and won't have been and won't have been removed, and so that is a rather odd thing. The other very odd thing about all of this is, of course, that it wasn't accompanied by a proper impact assessment. The only impact assessment there it was to the tune of 167 million, um, and that figure might seem somewhat random, but that was the cost of setting up the um, IMA, the um, Independent Mon Monitoring Authority. That's the body which is sort of intended to replicate um, the commission within the 
uh, the UK, and do note varied in the schedules of the Act um, ahead of the powers which are trying to limit the powers of the IMA, which is causing the European Parliament a lot of concern. Do remember that the European Parliament is still to vote on the withdrawal agreement. And that is it's an important stage. I mean, the trouble is all of our coverage is entirely UK-centric, and we forget that there is another side of the agreement. And the other side of the agreement is that the European Parliament still needs to vote on the withdrawal agreement for it to be passed. And also um, for um, the council still, uh, the council minister still needs to um, vote on it too. So that's my first point. My second point relates to the transition period, um, which the bill still loyally calls the implementation period, which has always been an absolute um, oddity of the term, because of course implementation suggests you're implementing something, when of course this. Um, the draw agreement is doing nothing, but it is, it's the divorce, it, it doesn't even provide the footprint towards what the future relationship might be. The original plan way back was that um, the transition period would be a sort of soft period where the new relationship would be, um, or the direction of travel would be towards the new relationship. Of course, now we know quite clearly the, the EU won't start talking about the new relationship until uh, after we have left IA until after the 1st of February. Um, of course, during the transition period, well, I think Stephen says absolutely right in terms of the effect of EU law in the UK, but it is important to remember that it isn't status quo in the full sense of the term, because we will no longer be a member state, which does raise potential problems with respect to the European arrest warrant um, for those countries that have had to amend their constitution to say that they will only um, send people back to other member states. Um, also remember that the EU, the UK won't be participating in any of the EU institutions, um, although some interesting things are happening in respect to the Court of Justice. Now, UK rep, the UK permanent representation, um, uh, is, um, uh, has been working on the premise that um, there will be um, no UK participation in the institutions um, since the autumn, um, and they've been preparing for this sort of no man's land position, or the position that um, my colleagues in the Norwegian embassy call coffee world, and that is that you spend an awful lot of time having coffee with those who are sitting at the table to find out what's going on, because you're not at the table yourself. Now, there is a very odd clause in the bill, um, Clause 29, um, and Clause 29 um, uh, is essentially the bill cash clause, um, and that says that um, the EU Scrutiny Committee is going to carry on looking at um, the measures that are being passed um, in the period of transition to see if they raise a vital national interest. Now, that's very odd because quite even if the vital national interest is at stake, what we can do about it is not clear because we are obliged to comply. Although, in fact, actually, if you think about the timeline, in respect of directives at least, um, a lot of the directives which are passed during the transition period won't actually have to be implemented until two or three years later, which means after we have already left, so perhaps that's not so serious. And then there is the point about extension. Now, Article 132 of the Withdrawal Agreement says that there can be a single decision of the Joint Committee to extend the period of transition from to one, by one or two years. Now, um, we also know from the manifesto and now in Clause 33 of the Bill that there will not be um, a request for an extension. And therefore, putting pressure on to negotiate the agreement um, by December 2020. In reality, it's a mixed agreement. And for those of you not familiar with that terminology, a mixed agreement is one that uh, requires not just agreement of the EU, but also uh, ratification by all of the national and regional parliaments, of which I think there are 34, because that includes the six in Belgium which includes Barney or Wallonia, who that nearly blocked the Canadian seat of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. So the trade agreement really has got to be negotiated by September at the latest. And remember, too, the future trade agreement will also have to be implemented in the UK because we're a dual receiving system. 
Um, and so that will require time, particularly if it requires quite extensive secondary legislation as well to give effect to the future trade agreement. So um, uh, civil servants are going to be pretty busy over the next um, few months, remembering also that they will be negotiating trade agreements with the US and uh, roll over trade agreements at the same time. Now, the million dollar question, which nobody knows the answer to, is let's assume we do not um, ask, and we won't, seems to be under Rule 33, for an extension by the 1st of July 2020 deadline. And let's just imagine, by chance, that things are going well on the negotiation of the trade agreement, but it is a mixed agreement and so does need a bit longer because it's going to take a while to get the trade agreement through the 34 or so national and regional parliaments. What happens when the um, Article 50 runs out of room. What happens when we get to the 31st of December 2020? What's the mechanism for extending even for three months or so to get the um, EU, uh, any future trade agreement through? Now, a lot of people, and I think myself included, have always assumed that Article 50 gets switched off on the 1st of February um, uh, 2020. Some international lawyers argue that's not correct, that it's essentially a continuation of an Article 50 agreement, and therefore it's possible to carry on using Article um, 50 to extend um, the application of at least Article 132 of the withdrawal agreement. Others say, God, this is difficult, maybe we could do some fudge and have some sort of international arrangement, and let's hope that nobody challenges it. But it is not straightforward on the point of actually huge practical importance. So that's my second point. Um, my third point is actually related, which is about um, the scrutiny of the next phase in the process. Um, there was originally a clause, we had clause 31, which has now disappeared, that said there would be um, some sort of negotiating mandate given to parliamentary, uh, given to the government and parliamentarians to approve it, and that there would be scrutiny. Now, that's gone, and obviously, government with a stonking majority doesn't need to get the approval of Parliament um, at, for the negotiating mandate. But actually, if we were in a sensible system, this future trade agreement will be, have an impact on the UK life and the economy for the, probably the next 50 or so years. And so the very fact that um, there is um, uh, no scrutiny of the process looks to me to be incredibly short-sighted. Now, of course, the government doesn't really mind because they want to get what they want, but this, the next stage in the process is actually, I think, even more important than the divorce, and yet the absence of parliamentary scrutiny or committee scrutiny is really very concerning. The CRAG, um, I think it's a constitutional reform yeah. and governance act, which does require treaties to be made, what, Three weeks or something mm -hmm. before Parliament, um, the Crag is clearly not fit for purpose. Because remember, the Crag was fine when um, the EU did all the negotiation of um, trade agreements and other international agreements. But of course, as we know, one of the uh, Brexit um, premiums is the opportunity for the UK to negotiate trade agreements. Surely there should be some accountability and scrutiny. Which brings me to my final point, which is a very dull one, but a tricky one, and that is the wonders of the Joint Committee. Now, the Joint Committee actually will be really important from February onwards. The Joint Committee is the committee which operates between the EU and the UK. It's a ministerial committee, and it will have subcommittees covering matters, extremely important matters, like um, sorting out the hugely complicated nuts and bolts over the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, sorting out um, provisions on citizens' rights um, and so forth. And I think there's another half a dozen or so other subcommittees. But the Joint Committee is the big beast. What's so remarkable is there is essentially one clause um, on the Joint Committee in the bill. There's now been an additional one that's referred to by Alison about the written procedure. All it says is that there will be a ministerial co-chair um, for, so ministers are going to have to sit in every one of these joint committees. My God, they might regret the rod for their own back that they have created when they discover quite how dull some of these negotiations will be. But nevertheless, this joint committee is crucial for negotiating all sorts of important things. There is no detail in the WAB at all about who's going to 
uh, how the joint committee is going to work, who the UK is going to send, any um, uh, mechanism between um, the joint committee and parliament and any of the select committees that they will get set up. And so I think this is one of the many Achilles heels of this piece of legislation. So um, that's the, 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 the three points I wanted to make. I'd like now to turn the floor over to you for any questions you might have or thoughts or observations. It doesn't have to be questions. And also, if you can tell us, particularly for those of you who've been working on the WAG, if we've got things wrong um, and um, how or if you think you read the act in a different way to us. So, so bold over by the effect of <laughs> the, the um, so I've got a question that goes back to the data courses. Um, and it's the fact that we've had this piece of the one which discusses the as one of my previous final legislation. Um, over the years we've had the, this concept of constitutional final legislation, and the truth is I'm quite terrified of the funds. Um, and my fear is that what you said about slightly more party like the Magna Carta, I, I believe Robert Cummings might think would a constitutional piece of final legislation be able to be overridden by a constitutional clause. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the Supreme Court. Yes. They, they, they would definitely be able to say uh, it, it doesn't have a good absolute yes. thing. Yes. Uh, you could have been always uh, reading into sort of the precise words of yes. the Act yes. in consequence. Yes. It wasn't that the other way. There's two ways of possibly reading it now. One is the generic which is where you read down general provisions that are going to contradict our fundamental legal principles of the Constitution, so fundamental common law rights, fundamental constitutional principles. So one way is to say, well, I'm, even though there isn't a specific recognition in Clause 41 that you can't use it to overturn a certain piece of legislation, we're going to read it down so you can't overturn fundamental common law rights. Now that might be problematic because when we look at the scope of the principle of legality, they will normally look at this section as a whole, and then beforehand you had 10 of the eight clauses that couldn't be used to overturn certain pieces of legislation like the Human Rights Act, um, devolution legislation, um, that was under the European Union Withdrawal Act, that's not replicated in clause 41. So you then got the tension of is this an indication that we're meant to be able to still do this? So that's already going to be problematic as part of our rules apply to principle of legality. The second is the way in which the Supreme Court reads down 10 of the eight clauses, which is a very odd wording. It's a sister principle to principle of legality. You find it in the public law project, and it basically says, you know you've got to all the words, and not just all you think. It, it doesn't really necessarily help us understand how we read it down, and normally it is read in tandem with fundamental principles of common law. So we're not really sure how far the general ability to read like any eight clause applies, because normally it's applied in tandem with the principle of legality and tied into fundamental constitutional rights or principles. So the bottom line is, welcome back to spider work. <laughs> These clauses will be used, people will contest them, it will go up to the Supreme Court, there will be lots of battles as to whether you can and cannot use them in certain circumstances. Um, that is essentially where we're going to be. And I can't answer that question because if you look at the wording, it isn't a problem. And there's always been this tension between the way in which the courts see there is such a thing as constitutional legislation and we treat it differently, and the way in which the legislature only has the aspect of, oh, if it's sort of constitutionally important, we put that whole thing to the house. That's it. And if you look at, if you want to be really pedantic, why was the early parliamentary general election act 2019 did not include a notwithstanding provisions of the fixed term mm -hmm. and wellness act because there isn't necessarily a recognition of the need to do that and you could have argued that sort of conflict with the constitutional legislation so it's further evidence that the legislature is not used to treating things like constitutional legislation differently in the way the courts do so, so the, the short answer to your question is we don't really know Um, that's a reassuring. Yeah, <laughs> 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 there are other questions. Yeah. Can I ask a, um, I haven't read the Act in detail, but 
of this that is really obvious. But what is the position that all the static instruments that they have made to be able to change in the New York? Because it looks like they're just changing exit dates and contribution dates, but not in the statutory. The idea is that there is a very complex way. It would be confusing. I have to have a look for it now, and I think it's good. I have to go back and look at it again to have what I'm saying. And um, yeah. especially as we've got this duplicity lot that's passed through the early proceedings before we go to leave. Yeah, and we're saying in the indoors, but we're still not going to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think at one level, I think it's given that citizens should be able to read the rights of citizens, they won't get any of their rights, sense of what their rights are from looking at the WAM. So they're going to have to go back to the withdrawal agreement, I think, the withdrawal agreement to constrain what can be done on the statutory instrument. But the fact is that the, the, the area which requires most transparency, because it's being read by people, I think most of them will have no legal qualifications, is lacking. In any clarity at all. Now, the argument against that is being what's all the duration rules from West um, Statutory Instrument. Uh, but it's still, I think, very problematic that um, it puts so much time in the hands of the executive. Now, that's where the IMA comes in. Um, but I think there is real um, concern about what happens when the settled status scheme comes to an end. Um, <clears throat> because um, we know, although the figure of 3.4 million is badly developed, there's a number to need to apply. Nobody knows if that's a correct figure because it fails to take into account any third country national stances of um, EU nationals. Now, much to shock around my family, every time I get into a taxi driven by an um, uh, uh, EU national, I answer where they're from and whether they've registered. And actually, it's quite a good um, uh, test, taste of how many have understood what the obligations are, and often the response range from yes, I have, to well, Brexit's not going to happen, or I've already got permanent residence, so I don't need to do it, um, to I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, at least at least at least, what about people who've got dementia um, who just by definition will not be um, uh, filling out the EU separate status um, on a non Apple? Um, uh, smartphone. I mean, this is, and 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 Brandon Lewis has said publicly that they will be subject to the full force of um, UK immigration law, which will include deportation if they don't have the right to remain. I think the other group, which is very vulnerable, actually, is people who've been here for decades um, but have never got British nationality, and they think, well, I've been here forever. This is an English problem. Why? Why am I should I be registered? Um, now that's insulting. I, I consider myself more British than Italian or whatever. There's one other thing to say about this uh, statutory issues um, that um, the ruling was attempted by John Bilko on the scope of standing in the court of um, has a knock on effect of reducing the difference between negative and affirmative employees. Um, it's quite arcane stuff, it's actually quite important what the Commons votes on. Um, under the previous dispensation, if the government didn't want there to be a vote, it could stop anybody getting into the uh, Commons in the UK for, well, for a long time, but especially for 40 days, it's provided for, for, for the time of the Commons. 
she wrote down her notes of uh, on special issues. The, um, and the way to do that would be by um, not putting the sort of prayer pages of the motion in the mail on the little paper of its own. And preventing um, anybody else having any time by not allocating any days to them. So it's theoretically possible for the opposition on the opposition day to, to perform prayer after business. But the government has got to decide, and still gets to decide, when opposition days happen. So it simply does not have an opposition day to do the days, and there will be an opportunity to, to, to debate the budget. Now, the difference. September 3rd rule uh, that you could have uh, emergency debates about substantive motion as long as you also mention the magic words have considered means that anybody who's got the support of the speaker and 40 other MPs can get a debate effectively on a prayer of another debate. So the government can't stop the debate now. It previously could have stopped the debate to not have a debate. Now it can't stop the debate, so it may as well be written and have a debate in government time. So um, that I think there will now be debates on 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 prayers and on, on motions to amend resolutions. Um, but the government, the government's got the majority, and it can use to uh, defeat the. Uh, Motion to amend. But I, but I think it's, um, and so that, that means the situation is not that different from the Burnham Rule, um, where, in fact, when the Burnham Rule works, uh, when you've got a majority, all you do is you refer it to a committee. And there's, there's a debate in the committee, the committee reports back and it's considered it. And there's then no debate in the chamber, the state vote. That's a vote without a debate. So, you know, the, 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 the difference in the negative and the positive is less than it was. Um, though we've still been told I'm not sure that any actual decision is going to get taken by the time. Yes. Um, instead of you saying you like to say, ask, I mean, I was rather kind of confused by the, um, the withdrawal agreement to provide for a single extension for up to two years, but now under the full sentence. So that's just totally overridden. Well, it's, it's not that it's overridden. So you can, they can they can ask for them, but the ministry is not empowered to agree to them. You didn't say that. You just said you're not really sure. You should may not. Those ones that he does. Well, he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what if you just can't because 41 plus 38 is going to be very close to the end. Yes. Yeah. Is your argument that clause 32 would be amended against the window? That the chances of getting an agreement they can, together by September. Yeah, but that, that's the point. The big pressure on getting the big pressure on negotiation would be the, the, the policy of <coughs> if we can't extend, then we're going to look at the fortune to make a deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, one plan. So yeah. that's always been the, the, the culture of the policy. Yeah. The fact that you can use it no deal is a threat again to agree with them. And a lot of people are against that. Yeah. Because, you, because the ministry can change the law. Yeah. 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 This is a magic law. Is there anyone else? Did you did you did you not say anything that you've already said? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't I don't see David's silence. <laughs> so on, on that I think we will we'll bring the um so to an end. I want to thank you very much for giving up your time on a wet uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, and I particularly want to thank um, our three magnificent speakers for being so uh, generous.